This is Corey Willis with PPI, and you're listening to The Diesel Podcast. I'm Adam Blattenberg from Diesel World. This is Dan, owner of Dan's Diesel Performance. I'm Cass from Diesel Doctor of Tennessee, and you're listening to The Diesel Podcast. What is going on, Diesel Nation? We're excited to have you guys with us today on the number one diesel truck podcast on iTunes. We had a few things we wanted to let you know about. First is, over the last couple years, you guys have asked us, hey, what's, what's a way I can help the podcast? Um, what are some things I can do you know, to help you guys? So we started a Patreon page. If you go to Patreon and just search the Diesel Podcast, you'll find our page there. we got a bunch of different tiers. So if you just want to buy us a coffee, help us edit more episodes late at night, or there's sections where we have giveaways, um, things that we're doing where you guys can pick the segment that's on an episode or ask a question, and I'll ask a guest on air. We're also working on a complete list of discount codes from our sponsors. So no matter what you're looking for, you can just go to one place, get the discount code, use it on their website, give them a call or any sales that they have going on for promotions you know, during the summer and, and into the fall. So if you have any questions, let us know. If you have any feedback on you know different tiers we should have, things we should add, anything like that, just let us know. We also want to welcome a couple new sponsors to the podcast. The first one is Merchant Automotive. We've chatted with Eric Merchant, the owner of Merchant Automotive, before. We're really excited to have them as part of the podcast and the expertise that they bring with Duramax, Allison Parts, tons of different things. They've got a really cool lineup of products. If you've got a Duramax, you've either heard about them, used their parts, or you're going to need them in the future. So stay tuned for an episode with Merchant Automotive. And also Complete Performance. We did an episode not long ago talking about OBS Power Strokes. That episode went crazy. It was so cool to chat with those guys. That's their specialty. They're passionate about those trucks. So we want to welcome them to the podcast and then also talk about some more OBS stuff with them and kind of pick their brain. And we know we got a lot of OBS fans that listen to us. We're going to bring you more content. But on today's episode, we're going to be chatting with Cass from Choate Engineering. And we love talking with Cass. He's got so much information about engines and cylinder heads and tons of different things. So today we're just going to open it up and talk about cylinder heads, whether it's a Power Stroke Cummins, Duramax, why the stock heads are made the way that they are, and things that he can do in the aftermarket to give you better performance, durability, longevity, efficiency, all those sorts of things. All right, let's get to the podcast, talking with Cass and learning more about diesel cylinder heads. Cass, it's great to have you back on the diesel podcast. We have a ton to chat about, and I'm excited to go through some of these topics with you. Yeah, man. It's great to be on again. We're excited. Always enjoy talking to you. I saw a post on Facebook, and it was, I'm not sure if it was a 6.0 or a 6.4 power stroke, but it was a picture of the head, and there were dimples inside of it where it looked like a golf ball. And I made a note, the next time you were on the podcast, I had to ask you, one, it's cool, but two, what's what's the science behind it? What's the reasoning? What what kind of application is that that going on? Yeah, the uh, we got we had a tremendous amount of uh, inquiries over that. Uh, it was it was crazy how many folks actually asked and had a theory behind it, and uh, <laughs> you know what 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 it was for. It was um, uh, it was funny to see some of the answers that uh, some of the people put on, and and uh, the truth of the matter is, dimple porting is nothing new to the industry. Uh, it's something that has been around for a few years now. But one thing that I found. Uh, you know, a lot of guys kind of get uh, frustrated. Some of the some of the guys get frustrated at me when I say this, but it's the truth. Um, the gasoline in, the gasoline industry uh, as a whole, in many ways, are leading or are, are advanced beyond the diesel industry in some aspects, maybe 15, 20 years, because they've been around longer. Uh, they've had a lot more time to develop some of the things. And the diesel industry is still the new kid on the scene, really and truthfully, because at what point nobody really wanted to drive uh, a diesel. In- Who wanted to drive a 6.2 liter GM diesel pickup? And I mean, <laughs> right. I, I had one, but I didn't really like it that much anyway. <laughs> so, um, but I mean, they just didn't make much power, and they were loud and uh, for obvious reasons. But as the industry starts to grow, and it has in tremendous fashion lately. Uh, and I say lately, in the last 15 years especially, it's just insane to see how, what the developments have, uh, have become, that you start seeing so much uh, progress that's being made. You start sometimes seeing that 
they're starting to reach back and find out some of these things. You know, something, something for instance, something that's so simple as like O-ring and a cylinder head, which everybody, you know, does O-ringing cylinder head. Well, that happened. That was way back when. That was back in the gas world. They started doing that. It was nothing that the diesel world really brought to that. They just stole it and changed the application for it. So when people start seeing dimple porting, they're like, man, what in the world are you doing? It's not that I, I wish I could say, you know, yes, I'm a, a genius. You know, I come and I think of this by myself and, and, and came up. I can't take credit for it. Uh, what I do a lot of times is I look for the application, something that might be successful or something that the, that the, uh, the guys that have a tremendous amount of investment and time and development in what they're doing, that uh, I take some of those ideas and maybe change the application. And by doing so, you really have some great outcomes. Um, they've done a lot of the homework for you, and you just they're they're using it and they're successful in in what they're doing, and we just take it. We have done that with cylinder head porting, uh, uh, but especially the dimple porting, we've been doing some testing and development with that. There's a lot of theory behind it. A lot of guys will tell you um, the idea behind it is uh, some some things, and that just leads into it uh, that you can't dimple port without talking about porting itself uh, with. And that goes again back to the gasoline side. And a quick overview of that, just to kind of give you some uh, uh, some baseline information here. Um, most people realize a carburetor or a tune port injection atomization occurs during the port. Right? At the port, that's when all this occurs. Um, so the theory behind it in in the gasoline world, some folks would say, well, the theory is is that if you dimple port, you don't allow uh, droplets of fuel to accumulate on the port wall. And what that does is it forces the fuel uh, into the uh, center of the of the port and it creates that atomization that needs to take place. While that is true, and not to not to take any uh, thing away from that, there are some other um, there are some other um, added benefits with it and that's what we're after. One of which is increased port velocity uh, because of the amount of friction losses that occur on the side of the port itself. Uh, it winds up actually causing a, uh, the the dimple port actually causes a disruption of air around the port. So what happens is when you dimple port that, it doesn't stick to the wall. You might say uh, the the air that's flowing through does not not want to adhere to the the side of the wall as though it it's almost counterproductive. But you have to think of oxygen as water because it has so the fluid dynamics of, of uh, has share so many similarities between that and and the uh, uh, the flow design. So that's what happens. It create it basically increases the velocity of which that the oxygen uh, can travel through that port, and that's what dimple porting is all about. But uh, you know, there's a, there's a lot more that goes into it. But that's just that's the basics of it. And we've started using that on. Um, actually, we started using that with Matthew Fetty in, in the Punisher build. So uh, that's kind of how that came about. That truck is so cool, and I had a blast chatting with Matthew late last year and we'll probably sit down and chat with him again is that trucks that trucks really cool but with with that kind of technology or, or design with the head is it something that you can see going to other cylinder heads say a 6.4 maybe into the cummins or the duramax platforms as well is it just something that's for racing or is it something where ideally it, it could be on any truck it doesn't have to be a race application well, there's always uh, benefits to adding that to any truck. Just, but uh, you know, don't want to be. We always want to appear, you know, honest. Before I'm not trying to sell anybody anything. Uh, my goal is to always educate the consumer, and an educated consumer makes my job a whole lot easier because when I get with him on the phone and he's already watched some videos and he's done some re- some good research. Let me just interject one second. A ton of stuff on the internet. That it's just absolute garbage. It's just you know I've got a sign in my office that says the trouble with the the internet is that you you never know uh, if uh, you never know if uh, what they say is true. And, and that was uh, quoted by Abraham Lincoln. So I've got one of those on you know, on my wall because that's the truth. You got so much. Uh, you, it's it's a, it's definitely aggravating. So when you get a guy on the phone and he, he's heard about you know. Uh, something that's false and he goes off on this thing you're just like wait a minute hang on let's get this you know let's get this straightened out let's let's uh let's let's just forget all that let's start from ground up and work the way up uh the port design can definitely aid but it's going to be um it is going to be most beneficial 
under the high performance application because of the sheer amount of boost pressures that you're seeing. But that being said, the flip side of the coin is a lot of people don't realize, um, I say a lot, I don't know if I've ever heard anybody talk about this, and this only comes from the tremendous amount of research and development that we've done with the cylinder heads during testing on track times and also testing on the flow bench. Uh, a lot of people don't have any clue as to what porting actually does and do they really need it. Because, I mean, when you talk about porting, you're generally talking about the guy that's got the big block Chevrolet and he's got uh, uh, or he's got a gasoline engine, or he's trying to go out to the track and he's trying to race, but not for diesel. The reason why you don't need it for diesel is because it's turbocharged. Well, you hear all this stuff. It's like balancing, you know. And I and I went through this same thing. I think you and I talked about this once before. It's so frustrating because you have this two percent that say stuff in the industry, and the ninety eight percent of people will pick it up and they'll preach it like it's the gospel. Well. It's not true. And then you spend the rest of your time trying to say, wait a minute, this isn't so. Let me show you the scientific evidence behind what we're saying. Um, the porting is how – it doesn't matter that you're turbocharged. Can it be beneficial? Absolutely. And let's talk – I mean, the way that I like to do when I talk to a customer or when I'm trying to do something in my mind uh, and try to figure out what, what's going on, if I can explain it or if it can be explained to me to where it makes perfect sense – then generally that is the avenue that you're going down. You're making progress. If it doesn't make sense and it's a far fetched, typically if it's a you know if it's a first baseman stretch on something, it's generally somebody's trying to sell you something if it just doesn't make sense. The port design, uh, any time that you increase mass air density in the cylinder, you're going to have more oxygen in that cylinder that's going to be able to produce power through you know the exchange of thermodynamic energy. Okay, so in order to do that, we call what we call boost pressure, which is just a measurement of restriction, which everybody's talked about that before. But boost pressure is a measurement of restriction because uh, you can try to funnel Niagara Falls down into a straw. And uh, what's going to happen is you're not going to change the volume that goes through the straw, but you at some point it's going to catch up, and there's not but a certain amount of fluid that can pass through. There's not enough but a certain amount of water that can actually pass through the straw. One thing that will change, though, is the increased velocity and the uh, sheer pressure that goes through that straw to a point. Now, if we take and we use that and we go straight to the cylinder head with the same idea because fluid dynamics um, and, uh, and uh, airflow is in many ways synonymous. One thing about that is, is if we increase the amount of boost pressure into a restricted uh, area, what happens is, is you're increasing the amount of pressure that's going into it. If you hear guys go, man, I'm running a 75 pounds of boost. Well, that's great, but what is that actually doing for the engine? Uh, I mean, obviously, PSI does not equate to horsepower necessarily. What it's doing is it's forcing all this oxygen into a very, very restricted area so that all the molecules begin to bounce against one another and they create friction. Well, pre pressure and temperature uh, are, and gas are synonymous in many ways. Freon, okay, same way. You know, you've heard PT charts. Guys talk about how does my, you know, Freon work. Well, once the Freon level, once the temperature starts getting colder and colder and colder, the Freon, the, the pressure of the Freon starts to drop. So we know that the temperature and the pressure are synonymous with one, one another, vice versa. If it starts to increase, your head pressure increases, then you know that your your uh, your temperature is also going to increase. The same thing works with oxygen. So now you're forcing all this oxygen into the engine. It, ha it creates a terrible adi adiabatic efficiency of the oxygen that's going through the cylinder. So now what's happening is that mass air density that we talked about, it is now going to the tank. It just decreases. It plummets. So all this heat that you're dumping into the engine is now counterproductive to a certain point. It reaches a certain peak level, and then it just drops. Now, the problem that – here's what I try to beat into the guys that work for me and, and the guys that I talk to, uh, uh, and this is something that I've learned, but it's an elementary thing that most people just – it blows right by them, and they don't get it. But this is something that has really – it dawned on me, and I, I mean, it's just a simple truth, but it's this. There's absolutely nothing you can do to the engine that is an isolated event, meaning – there's absolutely nothing I can do to that engine that will only affect what it is that I'm doing. For instance, if I wind up changing, 
I could do something just as, as simple as changing the engine oil. That is not an isolated event. That's going to change the pressure, uh, or excuse me, it's going to change the uh, the bearing load. It's going to change the temperature at which the oil runs. It's going to change a tremendous amount of things straight across the board. Now, the same thing means uh, if you apply that same reason, it's just it, it transfers itself over to this situation and makes it really obvious and easy to see. So now we have decreased, uh, or excuse me, we have increased the amount of pressure that's going into this. In order for that to take place, that means the we have to increase the back pressure uh, coming out of the engine now. We're increasing the amount of pressure that's coming out of the engine in order to spin the, the turbine, right? right? Now we're having to work the turbocharger harder, which that in, in turn means we are creating a lot more heat to make the same amount of oxygen that's being shoved into the engine that's already hot. So what it is is it's counterproductive. You're increasing the amount of dry pressure that you have on the cylinder head because you have to increase, uh, in order to increase the boost pressure, the dry pressure also goes up, right? So it is, it's, a, it's, an, it's a working awesome between uh, making uh, everything on, on the intake side, bringing it into a, uh, um, a, a lesser restriction, and freeing up that airflow, it decreases the amount of back pressure that's on the engine. It makes the engine last a lot longer. It's a lot happier. It doesn't have to work as hard to create the same amount of horsepower. So you free that up. So that makes an enormous amount of a difference just by allowing for bigger ports. One of the biggest things, though, that I see is people don't understand emissions on a vehicle. Okay. Um, most of the time you hear a guy talk about emissions. He says, you know, my truck's deleted and I've done this, that, and the other to it. What he really doesn't realize, and I think we talked about this too on another episode, is, is you're, uh, we were talking about how oil is still emissioned oil, you know, because they've stripped the zinc that's out of it. What a lot of guys don't realize is their, their engine is an emissioned engine. They have no clue that that engine, they think that the emissions went, uh, was, they think that the emissions began and ended with a DPF or the EGR. That it doesn't. And here's how I can prove it to you. In 03, we all know the 6-liter came out and they had EGR coolers. In 04, the LLY came out and they had EGR coolers. But you notice Cummins didn't have anything as far as an EGR cooler on an 03, notwithstanding the California emission yeah, engine, okay? But for the other states, they didn't have... The EGR coolers, people go, well, why not? Well, what was it? How is it that the Cummins just ran with so much uh, lower hydrocarbon levels that they were able to pass the emission standards? One of the things that they did in order to make that work to their advantage was change the camshaft. The camshaft has a certain amount of what we call reversion. It means that the exhaust gases are staying inside the cylinder longer than what they would under normal events. It's not completely being cleared out. With that being said, that was able to lower the hydrocarbon levels and the, and the uh, carbon monoxide levels that were being emitted by the engine. Okay, So the camshaft profile was ground with the intent of emissions in it. The cylinder head also has a, the intent of emissions in it. If you look at the port on a cylinder head on a four valve per cylinder head engine, you will notice two things, one of which is a port that resembles like somebody actually wanted air to go in the engine. The other one resembles a port like, <laughs> uh, we're trying to choke this thing to death, okay? And people go, well, that's the swirl port. That's the swirl port. Well, that's true. You're absolutely right. It is the quote-unquote swirl port. But then it blows their mind because they're still thinking about gasoline engines. Atomization, that is meaning the uh, basic uh, sharing of the, uh, of the fuel and mixing of the oxygen with that fuel. That's atomizing. Like if you were to put your finger over garden hose and you were to, uh, you were to try to spray it to a fine mist, that, that water in all uh, essence would be atomizing basically. It's, turn, it's spraying. It's turning it into a fine mist. Atomization does not take place like a gasoline engine in the port. It takes place at the injector tip. That's a huge difference. There's, and then you go, wait a minute, well, so what big deal? What does that mean? That means that the swirl port that you're talking about, the swirl effect and everything that you're talking about on that, does not come into a factor like a, in a gasoline or a diesel engine as it does in a gasoline engine. Well, why would they have it? Well, I can tell you why they have it. It's because your engine has got an EGR valve on it. What it does is it recirculates the exhaust gas, uh, the exhaust gases back into the cylinder. And 
they need that swirl effect to take place so that it can actually mix these hot gases that are coming right back from your exhaust back into the fresh air so that it can do its job as far as emissions. So when you tell me that you've got a truly emission-free engine, you don't. Your cylinder head and your camshaft are selling, telling me otherwise because it was designed in order for those emissions to, or those, those gases to be recirculated and burned. Now, somebody goes, well, wait a minute, you can't do that because you know, the swirls, you know, you're affecting the swirl in the port. Well, we know why the swirl is, is, uh, is there. It's for the exhaust gas. But let me ask you this. Have you ever heard of anybody fly cutting a piston? You say, well, yeah, I've heard plenty of people doing that. Okay, well, how much disruption do you think actually takes place when you put a valve relief there? Because you've got to admit, you know, the piston's coming up. Or what, about, what about when you dilute the piston on the bowl of the piston? The problem with it is, and we see the failures of the pistons, and we, we have done development on this, and we change the piston bowl design, and we cut and we lift the piston, and we do several things to make that piston live a longer, happier life by removing the lip of the piston and by machining it to our, to the, to our specs, to our, for lack of a better term, a proprietary spec. I hate that word uh, because it's thrown around so much in this industry, and it's just, some of it's just silly. Um, but the, uh, the problem with it is, is if that were the case, then you know how much of the disruption would take place because of all the pockets that you now you're putting four valve reliefs in the top. So when the piston does come up and it's compressing, what do you think is happening to all the oxygen that's in the cylinder? Do you think that because the uh, the valve reliefs are cut that it's not going to affect the quote unquote swirl port of the of the of the cylinder, the oxygen cylinder? Sure, it is. It's going to change it drastically. So apparently they haven't had any issue with the valve reliefs, right? But now all of a sudden they're going, wait a minute, what about these port designs? These port designs, you can't do that. Yeah, actually, if you know what you're doing, you can do it. And you can do it really well, and it makes it really effective. And it actually increases the port velocity so that the more oxygen now gets into the cylinder. Uh, and your volumetric, you know, you, you're, you're talking about uh, the camshaft. We were talking about reversion. One thing that that affects is volumetric efficiency. Um, it makes a huge makes a huge deal when you can you can only pour so much water in a cup if the water is if there's still water residing in the cup when you fill it that means if i can't clear the cylinder i can't fill it as full as what i would that makes perfect sense okay yeah. got it well if you can clear it and make sure that it's clear for the next time for that charge to take place well then now you get a hundred percent or more volumetric efficiency so, anyways, those are just some things to think about. People talk about, and I hear all kind of discussions on that. I'm thinking, yeah, man, I don't agree with that. Hang on just a second. <laughs> but um, but that, that is what we've been spending a tremendous amount of time developing. Um, and it has made a big difference in the performance of the engine, the longevity of the engine now, because you got rid of your EGR off, but now you're still choking the engine down. Ported heads, and I... And I, let me say this, and I know I'm just a one big run-on sentence, but um, the ported heads um, have uh, without that without the EGR, and uh, because you've many people have already removed that, it it ends up lowering boost pressures. And a lot of guys will call me and say, "Hey, you know, I had these heads ported, but my boost pressures are lower. That's great. That means that now we're not having all that heat build up because of." all the pressure that it's basically running into to try to cram all the oxygen in the cylinder and just increasing the amount of heat. You're going to notice a drop in boost pressures, but you're going to notice an increase in mass air density. Then that's the name of the game. That's what you're trying to get. You're trying to get the greatest efficiency in thermodynamic energy, the greatest amount of transfer. That's what makes power, not some boost number. So, yeah, you'll notice that because there's no more restriction. Um, and I see guys all the time that are buying these ported intakes, and I just blows my mind. Don't get me wrong. There's some. There's definitely um, reason to buy, especially some of the intakes that are, are on manufacturers. And this doesn't just mean uh, the Power Stroke world, but it's it, this transcends the, the Duramax and the Cummins as well. Everything I've said goes for everybody that owns a diesel truck because everybody is affected by the same thing, and that's that's uh, that's emissions as well. And so that all the manufacturers are using basic de these these uh, uh, processes and these designs in order to make the uh, the engine meet emission standards. But the intake, you know, it's like a guy taking a logging chain and hooking 
to another truck to pull it. But then before he gets to the end of the, the logging chain to wrap around the hitch, just decides he wants to tie it on with a thread. Well, that's stupid. You've got a logging chain, but it's going to break at the weakest point. It's the same way with a with a intake. You want to make this huge intake, but then you go to your head and you look at the cylinder head, and this thing's restricted down to nothing. If you literally pulled the valves out and looked at this thing, you can barely put your finger through. The tightest point of, say, like a 6.0 power stroke head is right around 5 eighths of an inch, around 620, well, about 625,000, something like that. Um, and that's, it's, it's insane how tight those ports are, uh, which is one reason why nobody wants to do it. Porting is not just polishing. We're actually removing quite a bit of material. Matter of fact, in an aluminum head, when we get done porting it, we've shed about a pound and a half of material out of the ports. That's a lot. Wow. And that's an aluminum. <laughs> anyway. Episodes like this, like when I'm, uh, I was listening to you talk about all this stuff, and like all these ideas are popping off in my head. Like I was all over the place. I'm like, yeah, I've had friends or even myself, I'd buy a part. You know, somewhere in the air system, whether it's, you know, a charge pipe or intake or something, I'm like, I didn't really notice any difference. Well, I haven't addressed the issue in the head itself. And I'm a Cummins guy. I love Cummins Nation. But one of the things we do is it's like the boost number. I hit 60 pounds, hit 70 pounds, hit 72 pounds. And you hear, you see that go one of two ways. It's either... You know, I popped a head gasket or did something in the engine and now I'm into an engine build or I've kind of peaked with performance. And as a consumer or truck owner, I think the last thing or most of the time, the last thing we look at is the head and what you talked about. It's, well, I need a different turbo. I need bigger injectors. I need to go dual stroker pumps. I need to do all these other things, but I'm still, like you were saying, you know, trying to dump Niagara Falls into a straw, we're still trying to do the same thing. And so I think a lot of money is wasted and frustration in chasing all the other things when we're talking about a head that's designed for emissions and certain things it needed to do, whether it's an early 5.9 common rail or you know the newer 6.7 commons. That's really the issue. And so you have to ask yourself, you know, as a, a truck enthusiast, and maybe it's a street truck or race truck, whatever it might be, or even a tow, a tow truck is how what's my next step and where should i focus the money and attention and what questions should i ask instead of let me throw bigger injectors in well you're still stuck with the same head that you were when you started and maybe that's the issue yeah and you made a really good point when you said you know i blew a head gasket well there's something that okay the earlier uh, the earlier power stroke guys uh the 60 guys okay and i know and, and eventually we're going to uh, if you continue to have a song, we'll wind up going and, and progress because there's there's so much to try to cover on one particular platform. I literally yeah. we could I could do a podcast for a solid two weeks on one you know on one particular engine, especially well there's certain engines that that you could spend more time on even than others. But you said something uh, about blowing a head gasket, okay? And something I noticed when uh, I realized uh, when I was a tech working on some of these trucks. We would have a head gasket failure of um, uh, maybe a 6.0, and the reason why it would fail would be because it would be because the exhaust back pressure sensor just plugged up, so that the computer didn't see uh, the exhaust back pressure that it was calling for because it was using that to tune to to, um, to uh, control the vanes of the turbo, so it would cause it to continue to increase boost, increase boost. Well, what it was doing was increasing drive pressures, so that they could not allow or would not allow the pressure to exit the cylinder and it would blow a head gasket and a lot of times the whole failure was only because the guy didn't clean out his his ebp tube and he was all frustrated and thought oh this is a big piece of junk well that it is a point i mean a perfect point as to what blows head gaskets is it boost pressure or is it drop pressure and i heard somebody had made that post um somebody had made that post a, a while back uh, in a I forgot where it was at or what page it was, and I thought, you know, that's a good question. What people don't realize is it's both. The reason why I say it's both is because you can't is it you can't have one without the other. You can't have boost pressure without having drive pressure. You can't have drive pressure necessarily without having boost pressure. It, it's it, you can uh, on the drive pressure side, but if you're spinning that turbo, it's going to take heat to spin the turbo and pressure, which is you know heat and pressure there. Again, we said they're synonymous. You can't have one without the other. 
So if you can lower the amount of drive pressure that you have on the engine because it breathes better, it's going. And that's where I guess where I was meaning to get to was guys go, well, I don't need to port my head because I'm just you know it's a daily driver, and I mean I use it to tow and I tow my boat, and I actually use this truck to work with, and I actually um, I, I, I pull hot shot trailers or whatever. I don't need it. I'm not racing it, so I don't need porting. No, you're wrong. You're totally wrong. Your thinking's wrong on that. It's not that it's not needed because you're using it performance. The truth is, is for better reliability and longevity, a better breathing engine that has less heat building up in it, what do you think it's going to do? You think it's going to live longer, or live, you know, uh, uh, a shorter life? It's going to last longer. The more that you can uh, reduce the coefficient of thermal expansion, expansion takes place, friction takes place, friction takes place, wear takes place. And it's always going to make it live longer. So, yeah, will porting ahead actually cause an engine to last longer? The answer would surprise you. It actually will because you're able to reduce the exhaust gas temperatures and the drive pressures that you have, and you're able to increase the mass air. The mass air density, yeah, that's great, but the engine's no longer breathing hot air like what it would because you're cramming this oxygen where these molecules are bouncing around. It's breathing the cooler air, which means that it cools off the intake valve a lot more than what it was before because you have a uh, greater absorption rate. So there's a lot more that goes into just doing uh, a porting on, of a cylinder head. And let me reiterate that. I have people all the time that send me cylinder heads, and they said, my heads are already ported. And I look at those things, and I go, buddy, they didn't do anything, but to, you know, they polished them. That's it. Who cares? It doesn't. Polishing is not going to really do anything for you on that. We need to remove some material. We need to make. We need an operation. <laughs> you know, we need to. We need to cut into this thing and make it make it larger and and, and manipulate the port so that you get the most. So it's most advantageous for you. I think to bring this back around, and I'm I'm making sense of all this too, and understanding more. We had talked about the gas world being 15, 20 years ahead because they started sooner, and you look at new vehicles and you know some of these cars have 700 750 760 horsepower and they are you know they're new off the lot they met emission standards do you think or foresee well i guess to step back do you think the cylinder heads were designed that way because it's kind of like there's these emission standards that diesel trucks now have to meet and this is a cost effective way for us to be able to meet those standards by restricting the efficiency of the cylinder head or heads and be able to do it. And then, you know, kind of, I think as time goes by and, and we get more efficient and forward thinking with it is, Hey, we can actually, you know, improve performance and improve efficiency and all these things. If they just came that way from the factory, instead of being so restricted the way they have been in the past. So you're asking me, do I think that the – would the engines uh, be more uh, efficient if they would do it just from the factory? If yeah. it, it, why do, Are you asking, why don't the engineers do this in the first place? Yeah, why don't they do it in the first place and just have an efficient engine right away and, you know, be able to atomize more of the fuel? All right. Well, because it's real simple on that. I, I think that this was – okay. All right. Look at the gasoline world. Have you noticed Ford doing – everything's turbocharged now. Yeah. Have you noticed that trend? Everything's mm -hmm. turbocharged. Okay. Well, that's great. That means that we can get away with a lot less because we can increase volumetric efficiency through the turbocharger. Fine. The other thing, though, that is is we do, again, have to meet the emission standards in order to do that. So they're using turbochargers. Okay. If you look at your valve cover, all right, uh, it will say on the side of the sticker, everything that has anything to do with – um, emissions, okay? It'll actually has a listing there. And on many of them, it, it will say this, turbocharging. That is something to do with emissions. How does turbocharging have any direct correlation with emission standards? I mean, how can you tie the two together? Um, and there's, there's a lot of things that they're able to do with the port design because of the, uh, because of the use of you notice almost all engines now, all engines now are four valves per cylinder. One of those valves, or excuse me, one of those ports uh, that, that feed that have a direct, through the turbocharger, we're able to now reroute the exhaust gases back into the engine and by using this other port as an emission port. 
it actually helps to lower that. So they're able to make the power that they're making because they turbocharge it. But then they need that port to be able to reach the EPA standards. So it's it's kind of a two wheels on the same axle. Gotcha. Um, yeah, could they make more power? Absolutely. Would they be able to meet the EPA standards? Probably not. And what they're doing is, is they're trying to not – they realize that certain things with the DPF – and uh, with the, the emissions that are already in the exhaust system and the immense heat that builds up in there, they realize that that's going to wind up causing and leading failure. So they're trying to combat the emissions with the most, uh, with the least, what's the word I'm looking for, with the, with the least obstruction, uh, uh, least um, uh, amount of, of uh, adverse causing um, uh, approach, I would say. They're trying to... Uh, do away with they realize in the with the 6.4 liter you know that's just bad if you start pouring diesel fuel down the last two cylinders it's going to wash up cylinder walls bad things are going to happen <laughs> and they learn that really fast and so they okay well we got to we got to figure out something else what we can do about that and so then they started having to try to make everything that was going to happen take place downstream and moving it further and further away so then they can start talking about okay well what can we do with the emission systems as far as exhaust gas recirculation is concerned we need this to be – because the thing is, if it doesn't swirl in the port, it will not burn all those gases properly, and it's not going to be effective in the way of emissions. It's not going to be effective in the whole design for the EGR. Um, and they need that port to swirl in order to reintroduce that charred and burnt gas back into the cylinder so that it can actually um, uh, try to uh, – to burn it, to uh, reburn all those existing gases, so it has to swirl. If it didn't, it wouldn't be effective, and that's the point of the swirl. Um, now, guys go, well, you got to be really careful on the seven three. It's different. The reason why the seven point three liter is a little bit different is because the port of a seven three. There's a couple of things about that. The port design of 7.3, we approach it differently than we do on a 6 liter or something that has a variable geometry turbo or a 6.7 power stroke, or 6.7, um, not power stroke, but a 6.7 Cummins uh, or even the 6.7 power stroke, whatever has a variable geometry turbo. The reason why is because we can com use some of those things to combat the lag of a 7.3. you got to be careful because you basically – if you're taking a stock 7.3 engine and then you open a port up, but you don't do anything with the turbocharger to match it, you actually wind up. It, it'll actually not. It'll. It, it can underperform. The ports are, or, or the uh, the stock turbo is is extremely, um, for that amount of of uh, displacement on that engine, uh, it wasn't ever intended to. I mean, let's face it, the thing made 200 and what? Was it 210, 215 horsepower or 235 horsepower from the, from, the, uh, from the factory? It wasn't designed for that. So the port, if you do change the port on, on the 7.3, it almost mandates uh, changing the turbocharger as well um, to be able to get the full benefit of it. Whereas if you take something along the lines with a variable geometry turbo and then you couple tuning with that, that port, I can make – I can make my throttle response even better, really, really good, because I can get a little bit more aggressive with the uh, the veins on the turbocharger to increase uh, the spool up, or decrease the amount of spool up time. So there's different approaches, but on a fixed vein turbo, we don't really see that anymore. I mean, we're not. We're, when is the last time that you saw that five nine Cummins or a seven three or uh, an LB seven? You don't you don't see that on on anything else. What's so refreshing and informative about talking about cylinder heads with you is like we can go on to social media or forums or read articles or something or just be talking to somebody and it's like we speculate what happens. What happens when the EGTs hit 1800 degrees? What happens when, you know, you crank 75 PSI through a stock head or, you know, what are these things going on? But you get a ton of engines in every week as cores. You see what happens to them. You see what all these other either uses or parts or you know quite frankly use and abuse can do to them and what fails whether it's an older truck with an internal egr whether it's a new one anything in between you're able to see that take that information and with the machines and the technology and expertise you guys have be able to address it and, and offer you know products or advice or information that's so useful 
whether you got a Cummins, a Duramax, or a Power Stroke. Definitely, and I would encourage anybody to. Um, okay, this is just kind of just a snippet of something, uh, and this is a really elementary thing. But I enjoy these things. I like. I, I, I told you before. And I think we were talking off off the uh, radio here. Um, I, I like Colombo. I like House. I like you know Who Done It kind of stuff. <laughs> yeah. You know, I, my mind just. I, I, I live for that kind of stuff. I love to. Uh, uh, I have a very analytical inquisitive mind and it's not enough for me to know that it happened i want to know why it happened you know that's fascinating to me uh so i try to put stuff that's on the pages that not you know that other people aren't maybe aren't really it may have nothing to do it's not going to sell me a darn thing i don't care it's interesting for me so and i that's actually counterproductive too because my mindset if it's not interesting for me I won't post it, but it may be interesting for somebody else, and I'm bad about that. I'll, I'll be, and people will tell me, "Well, why don't you do that?" I'm like, I've seen it before. Well, somebody may not, you know, somebody else may not have seen that. Well, you think they'd be interested? Because I don't know, you know. So I won't post it. But like a little snippet, if you get on uh, of what I was going to post, uh, I'll probably post this point tonight or something. And um, and I love getting, you know, playing stump the tech, and I walk over there, and I was doing that today, and I was. Uh, we had a 5.9 Cummins uh, come in the shop, and they're actually doing an install. Now, if you don't know about our shop, whoever's listening, we actually have two parts of the business. We have Chode Engineering Performance, and we do product development and engine builds, machining. We've got state-of-the-art, you know, we've got over a million dollars invested in machining equipment in the shop so that we can put out the latest and the greatest. And we've got testing equipment. We've got, we've just got the uh, Disney world of all gearheads, you know, I get to go in the shop and play around. It's great. I love it. You know, people go, what do you do when you're not working? Well, I'm always working, but if I'm not working, I want to go into work and play around when nobody's here. So, uh, that's, that's my favorite thing to do. But, um, anyway, uh, so the other side of our shop is a drive-in facility. Um, and you know, we have, uh, you can uh, send your truck to us or whatever. I'm not advocate. I'm not trying to, not a sales pitch or anything like that. But, uh, so I was walking over there uh, and it's two different businesses, but they're sort of kind of under one roof. The business continued to grow. And I joke with people because we have green roofs on top of our shops. Uh, I, you know, I joke with them and I tell them, hey, this place didn't start out looking like Monopoly, but it does now because it looks like, you know, those little greenhouses. <laughs> because I kept saying, I want to build a bigger building. And then, you know, you get too busy. I, I want to invest in equipment. I don't want to just invest in this, like, you know, 100,000 square foot, you know, shot. Yeah, I'd love to have it. Who wouldn't? But it doesn't really make any money. It's not really justifiable when you can make the shop that you've got. You expand the shop and you grow, but you can invest in equipment and technology. That's my deal. So I walked over there, and uh, so there the guy pulled the cylinder head off. And I heard the truck when he first pulled it in. I mean, this thing was like, no, 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 no. You know, it sounded like a thrashing machine. It's horrible. And uh, it was on a 01 Cummins, like a, you know, uh, it's a uh, uh, single thread O-ring metric uh, Cummins, 98 and a half to 02, right? So anyway, we, um, uh, this thing's knocking, it sounds horrible. So he gets the cylinder head off, and we know that thing's in for an engine. I mean, it's, it's obviously, it's a rod knocking. So we look at all the cylinder heads, or excuse me, listen to me, look, look at all the pistons. And there's one piston that uh, has got, uh, we always joke and say, it's got homemade valve reliefs. Um, you can see where the piston and the valve came in contact with one another. And I said, okay, I know which one's knocking before you tear it down. Because that's what I want to do. I want to, I want to diagnose before you tear it down, before you've done anything to the engine. I don't, I want to, before you turn the wrench, I want to know exactly, I want to see if I, I have my hypothesis matches with the doc, you know, it, it is actually, uh, the correct diagnosis. So anyway, I said, the number three cylinder is the one that's the problem. He goes, well, how, how do you know that? I said, what do you mean, how do I know that? I mean, it's pretty obvious. He goes, what are you talking about? I said, He said, well, I mean, I see the valve reliefs on it. So you think somebody was in this head before, and that's what caused it? That maybe they had a stick and valve guide or something like that? Said, no, that's not what happened. Well, how is it? What is it? You know, I said, okay, think about it. Let's let's pretend that you tore this engine apart, right? And then you just didn't replace the bottom lower rod bearing. Just You just left it out. Do you think it's going to have more dwell time at the top dead, at top dead center than it would if the bearing was in there? He goes, well, yeah, of course it would. 
I said, why? I said, because it's got to travel more crankshaft degrees before it starts moving back down because the crankshaft's only going to come in contact with the, the rod cap at a later date. They're basically separating, right? And they're coming back. Yeah. You know, it's, it's floating. I said, well, what do you think happened to the valves? you think they're still moving when the crankshaft? Oh, yeah, they're definitely moving. So you're saying that the piston stops longer? Yes. And he goes, oh, I got it. Okay, now I understand. The rod bearing is worn to the extent now that the crankshaft or the, the rod is hanging in air longer so that the valve smack it. I said, exactly. And they tore it down. That's what they found. <laughs> oh, okay, that's pretty cool. I'm like, makes perfect sense, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. That's cool. It's like, see, this is why I do this stuff. <laughs> so, anyway. So, but anyway. Yeah, that's... Uh... I think that's something too that uh, so many listeners in comments and all across social media, you get the guys that are like, Hey, my truck's doing this. What could it be? There's a thirst for that kind of knowledge. And I think being able to look at situations like that and kind of test yourself and think, what if I can diagnose this without tearing it all apart? And it can get even, you know, smaller. It could be a check engine light or something like that. But that's what is so cool about, diesel performance and diesel community and I guess any motorsport is just being able to understand the relationship. Like you said, change oil is going to change the temperature and how everything has this relationship and how they all work together. And that knowledge, I think it makes, you know, more educated truck owners, consumers, companies, technicians. That's the, that's a really cool part that I enjoy uh, about podcasts, about talking with you about stuff and just absorbing all the information. Absolutely. I mean, I, I do enjoy talking to customers. I wish I had more, you know, as we get busier, sometimes it's more difficult to be as accessible as what you want to be. Um, but I try, you know, I have a lot of guys that drive. It just blows my mind that somebody would take the time out of their day to drive all the way down here to pick up an engine just so that they could see our shop and talk to us. That to me is just, is, it's humbling and it's, uh, it, you know, I just, I, I, I see it happen and I'm like, man, I, you really drove from, uh, you drove from for Wyoming, Wyoming to pick this thing up? Yeah, man. I mean, we planned our vacation around this. Are you serious? That's crazy, man. That's that's awesome. But I want to talk to the guy and really get a chance to uh, go through and and educate because enlightenment. My dad used to say this: enlightenment is, enlightenment is excitement. <laughs> and I always thought, yeah, that's that's really if it's something that you enjoy doing. Uh, the more you learn about it, the better you get at it, the more fun it gets. And even if you're just a truck owner and you want to you know, increase the performance of your truck or whatever it is you want to do. Most of the guys, they, they want to do that, but they want to understand what's going on at the same time. And uh, I don't want to be the guy that just sells you the part and says, here, put this on, trust me, it works. Where I do want your trust, um, and I want it founded and, and, and because it's merited, uh, I do want you to understand. And I, that's the reason why when I was doing the diag stuff on the other side, and when I, we first started out, when I would try to diag a truck for a customer, I would tell them, okay, this is what happened. This is why it happened. Let me explain to you and lay everything out so that you can understand it in terms of, I want you to come to the same conclusion that I did. And here's all the facts presented to you. And then you can see why I diagnose it as this. And the guy would go, okay, yeah, that makes perfect sense. Okay, yeah, I appreciate you showing me that. And I would do that so that it makes for, the problem with, with our industry, and it's not just our industry, it's, it's industries nationwide or globally. It doesn't matter. You've got, and I hate to say it, but you do have some shops out there. Not, not a lot of them. They are, there's, there's, there's not, it's not the, it's, it's the exception, not the rule, but you do have shops out there that the guy has been scammed maybe before. Okay. Or somebody else that built an engine for him that has been scammed. that The guy wouldn't take care of him, whatever it might be. So the guy's already on the defensive when he calls you or when he comes into your shop, or whatever it is. And you have to earn that trust back with a customer. And that I don't like. You can, And I told this to somebody before. You can stand face-to-face -face with a guy that's a liar and call him a liar, and he, um, it won't offend him. But if you tell an honest person you know, that he's a liar, that'll make him, those are fighting words. That'll make him really mad really quick. And the deal is when a guy comes into the shop and he's telling, you know, this guy, he's already on the defensive, but I want to earn his trust. I want not just to earn his business, but when I when I tell him, they used to have a little, um, they used to be a little commercial that said, when E.F. Hutton speaks, people listen. And as investors, anyways, that you want to get that kind of, uh, you want to get that kind of trust with a customer. I'll tell you where to spend your money. I'll tell you where not to spend your money. 
uh, but you want that relationship with him because that guy, the next time he comes in and you tell him, you know, this is what it needs. You know, we looked it over. Let me show you. The guy goes, I trust you. You did a great job for me last time. I believe you. The first time he comes in, it's like, you know, he's got one hand on his wallet and he's clenching his other fist and you're like, easy, you know, back down. You know, I'm here to help. I'm not here to hurt. Okay. So anyways, you, that's, that is one of the main reasons why I spend as much time as I do trying to explain things to people. Because I would, if I was in that position, I'd want them to do the same thing for me. I've been in that position, you know, before where I didn't know. And it's like, you know, hey, you got it. You need this part and you do that part and it's still doing it. And you go back, oh, no, it's this one. And I've spent however much money it was and it wasn't fixed. You start to get irate. And then you're like, man, this sucks. And you call someplace else. And when I go into that other place, I'm not thinking, hey, this guy's going to take the time with me and go through it. He might have to keep it a few extra days because he wants it to. No, I'm just like, I don't trust. And. That's a really refreshing part of it is you feel you feel more comfortable and you understand, hey, they took the time to explain to me why this happened. Maybe if something he did as a truck owner, maybe it wasn't. Maybe it was just bad luck with a mechanical part that can fail. But that is that is so true. Yeah, absolutely. So um, there's the business is just a small aspect. How you handle the business is not uh, – it, it is a – it's like I tell people all the time, you know, and it sounds trite, but it's true. The bit, I could lose, you know what, I could lose everything that I've got tomorrow. And, you know, Lord willing, Kenneth knows he helped us the first time. He He's the reason why I'm here. But I can gain it back if I work hard with his blessing. I cannot regain my name. Once it's gone, it's gone. And a good name's rather chosen than choice silver and fine gold. It means more to me that I leave my son a company that is worth inheriting. A lot of people have companies that are inherited, but the names ran into the ground and it's not worth inheriting. Even though there's money in the bank account, it doesn't matter. You haven't left a goodly heritage. That's what the Bible calls it. It's a goodly heritage. I want to make sure that when he does come to age and he, if this is the route he wants to choose to take, I want to make sure, and it doesn't matter. I don't care that he goes and he wants to be a dentist. It doesn't matter to me. I want people to go, you know what? Your dad worked on my truck. I'm going to tell you, he told me the truth, or he built an engine for me. He did He did right by me, you, you know, because it means more to me that I've left his name. I don't, His my name isn't for sale. People joke with me all the time. They go, you know, you'd sell your own, you know, you, you, you'd walk everywhere and sell the only truck you got. I have, my best friend rags me all the time about it because I'll get a truck and I'll be like, I'm going to keep that truck. I like that truck. And he goes, no, you won't. You're a liar. He said, just as soon as somebody offers you some money for it, you know, you're going to sell it. And I was like, well, you know, it's probably true. <laughs> so, but there's one thing that I've got that is not for sale. And that's my name. I can't get it back. Once it's lost, it's lost. And I'm serious about that. And I mean, that's, you know, some folks say, boy, you know, you're, you're passionate about it. Yeah, I am. That's the only, that's the only thing that I've got really in this world next to my salvation and next to my, is my testimony. I've got, you know, if, if I've lost that, I've lost all. And, uh, anyway, that's the reason why I try to be as, as transparent as if, as I possibly can be. If there's something that I go above and beyond and show the person something, I don't like people to um I, I like people when they call me and they say hey i had an engine failure on something when you tear it down do you mind taking pictures no i don't mind that at all give me your email i'll sure do it this is fun we both learn together you know i'll show you exactly what happened tell me what the symptoms are i want to know then that way i can get this information when they tear it down i'm going to look at it i'll go over there i'll you know i'll take a camera over there and we'll shoot you know yeah i'm all about that that's fine i don't have a problem in the world doing that i would definitely like to do that but i want you know like i say it's it's about the name you know so well, this is a really fun podcast Cass. i i uh, realized how little i know about cylinder heads but i feel more educated <laughs> now <laughs> and uh, <laughs> i understand a little bit and it's a huge topic it, there there's so much you know, we could talk about with it but you, you guys are doing some really cool things with it and and there's also an engine build you're working on that i definitely want to chat with you about in the future mm. that yeah, looks I know what you're uh, talking about it looks really cool <laughs> 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 yeah, the diesel uh, power magazine had came in for well, it's probably like two weeks ago, I think it was. And um, anyways, Chris was here and taking some some pictures and uh, making me swear not to share stuff. I told him, I, whatever I did, I told him this. I said, look, hey, you are my buddy, you are my ally. <laughs> I'm not doing anything that's going to offend you. Okay. <laughs> so he actually stayed at our house, and he's a really cool guy. It's great to get to know him and uh, enjoyed. You know, I enjoy meeting people in this industry. 
that are passionate about what they do and, and really um, they're good. I like people that are good at what they do. I mean, I know that sounds silly, doesn't it? It, but it really is. I, I really enjoy – I like working with people that are really great at what they do because they take their homework – they take homework with them when they go home. And that's how I've learned how a good tech is going to be a good tech because I'm not just an engine builder. I'm not just – I didn't start out just as a mechanic. We don't just do research and development. I study people. You know, as a business owner and the guy that wants to come in and he's a tech and he wants to start and he may have went to college somewhere. Or he worked for somewhere a little while. The guys that are really the ones that get it, the ones that are sharp are the guys that go home and they study on this stuff when they leave. Those are the guys. That's the guy you want to mark and say, I want him on my team. And uh, anyway, um, those are the guys that are really passionate about it. Chris is. and He's a great guy to deal with. And, and he works with KJ. And um, uh, it was fun to do that that shoot with him but i told him i said i promise you i won't you know i'm not going to share i'm not going to put any pictures on so the only stuff that we've actually put on was stuff that uh the cylinder heads are already on and the um and matt's got some of his magic that he's working with the intakes and stuff like that so we shared some of that but the the secret sauce the stuff that's on the inside we've kind of uh we kept hush hush well it definitely looks like a very interesting cool build and i'm sure it's going to be going down the drag strip sometime <laughs> soon and <laughs> gonna be having some fun yeah. so look forward to chatting with you about that when we can some other things that i love doing these episodes with you and, and and learning about diesel engines and and just getting a better grasp of what's going on inside of them is there's so many moving parts they seem so complex but we that's why we listen to podcasts you know we want to learn about them so we appreciate your your time and I know you're busy there at the shop but had a great time chatting with you it's my pleasure always don't forget, diesel fans, make sure and check out Merchant Automotive and Complete Performance. Stay tuned for some episodes that we're going to have with those guys talking about Duramax, engines, Allison's, maintenance parts that Merchant Automotive specializes in, injectors, tons of different things. That's their bread and butter. And also Complete Performance, really jumping into the Ford Power Stroke OBS talk. And not just about performance per se, but you know, those trucks, they're, they're built to be reliable. That's why people gravitate towards them. They need a nice, solid daily driver and need a diesel truck they love the body style there's so many things that they have that they've made for them and that they offer on their site and you know make sure to check them out if you got an obs and also you know any questions or feedback or things you want us to ask the experts let us know on instagram facebook you can email into us at info at the diesel let us know we'll make sure it gets on an episode till next time keep the shiny side up <laughs>